let's make sure that uh, that we get ourselves fully concentrated now on the Word of God, and we want you to turn to John chapter 12 this morning, if you will. If you're using the church Bible that's in the rack where the song book is, uh, we have the page number up on the screen for you for all the scriptures that we'll be turning to this morning. So John chapter 12, uh, today we'll be looking at verses 34 through 43 for part 3 of the conclusion of Jesus' public ministry. Now it's not unusual to know someone who has lost confidence in their Christian faith because of unanswered questions, unmet expectations, or others' rejection. And what we see today in Jesus' final words at the conclusion of his public ministry, and that is followed by a commentary by John himself, is we see that all these things are sort of subtly addressed for anybody who might be losing confidence because they have questions in their lives that God hasn't answered or they have expectations in their lives that God has not met, or they're just really, really wary and dejected by others' rejection all the time, and they've lost confidence in the Christian faith because of these circumstances. Now, let's get this out of the way right now. Uh, you need to understand as we go forward in this message that the confidence of the Christian faith isn't designed to come by any other thing than complete trust in a person. And that person's name is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our confidence in our faith cannot come from anything else than Him, regardless as to whether or not things are going on in our lives that are so mysterious that we can't hardly stand it. All right? So, first of all, as I said, Jesus touches on these things, and that's why it's exciting. This can be very helpful to everybody, not only for yourselves personally, but as you counsel others, you can direct them, them this way, as, as we see these things are alluded to in Jesus' charge. We see, first of all, this morning, a charge that he gives to the people, and it stems from this, uh, verse number 32, he said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. So this is like Tuesday, December 4th, third, I, Tuesday, Tuesday, April 4th, Tuesday, April 4th, 30 A.D., and he is going to be crucified just three days later on Friday, April 7th. Where in the world did I get December? <laughs> I think I know, but I don't want to distract you. Like I said, we're supposed to be focusing today, so I'll tell you later how I got December, but uh, it's a long story. Well, it's not a long story, but it's a story. Okay, so... When Jesus said that, that he would be lifted up from the earth, he got this response in verse 34. The people answered him, we have heard out of the law that Christ abides forever. And how say you, the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So obviously, they have unanswered questions here. They have unmet expectations. Jesus has presented himself as their Messiah. He is the Son of Man. But now he's talking about a crucified Messiah. And they are not tracking with our Lord at all. Uh, this question it almost has some sarcasm in it. We know about the Son of Man. And he's supposed to abide forever. What Son of Man are you? saying that you are going to be lifted up, uh, basically saying the Messiah is going to be executed. Well, they understood, as we see in their question, Son of Man as a title for the Messiah. But the Son of Man 
being crucified was not part of their messianic expectations. Now let's just get a little Bible knowledge on this. Where does the term son of man come from? A lot of people misinterpret this because they only see it in the Gospels and they really think that, well, because it says the son of man, that title emphasizes Jesus' humanity. Well, it can, of course. There's nothing wrong with that. But if we go back to Daniel chapter 7, we see this is where the word originated, the title, and it absolutely refers to uh, Israel's Messiah. So if you go to Daniel chapter 7 and find verses 13 and 14, Daniel expresses, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, see that there, came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him, the Son of Man, dominion and glory and the kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is a what? An everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. So you can see when these people listening to Jesus and hearing about him announce his crucifixion, why they might be a little confused and why they might be a little sarcastic. What son of man is this? We know the son of man in Daniel chapter 7 who has an everlasting kingdom. Just for a little bit more on this, uh, so we can understand them a little bit more. If you turn also over to Daniel chapter 2 and verse number 44, same idea. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people like the Romans but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So these people, when Jesus announced that he was Messiah, they were looking for deliverance from Rome. They were putting their expectations on what they had learned from the book of Daniel, and as they say, the law, uh, meaning many other scriptures in the Old Testament, referring to the Old Testament scriptures, and yet Jesus had made this announcement uh, that he will be lifted up. And this he says signifying what death he should die. So they asked the question. Who is this son of man? And now we see Jesus' answer in verse number 35. Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Commandment one, walk while ye have the light lest darkness come upon you. For he that walks in darkness knows not wh whether he goes. He says is his answer in verse number 35. Now, he says, yet a little while, the light is with you. When he talks about the light, he's talking about himself, right? Didn't he say in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world? Amen. And so he's referring to himself. He was going to be crucified and, and then, of course, ascended. And he's not going to be with them uh, much longer on the earth. And so his admonition to them is, okay, you, you, you don't quite understand what's going on. You have questions. Um, these are not quite your expectations. Um, so listen up. What you need to do is, while uh, you yet have a little light, walk while you have the light. Amen. So Jesus, again, is reiterating, he is that person. He is the light that shows the very presence of God and brings to this dark world true knowledge. Amen. So this is what you can do. You can focus on me, because if you continue to focus on me, and you begin to trust me in spite of all that you might not be understanding at the moment, 
What you will have in me is the very presence of God, and you will have true knowledge. So just listen up. Now, I said that when he said, walk while you have the light, um, this word is a commandment. If we were to look at the New Testament in the Greek language, it's very clear the way this word is written in Greek that it is a command. And so his, his word to them is right now the way you're feeling. You need to do one thing, walk in me. And so this command to walk means to keep on living by the light that I have given you. Don't get ahead of yourself. Live right now in what I have revealed. Walk in the true knowledge that I am bringing to you in spite of perhaps confusion. And the reason for this is what he says in the rest of the verse. He says in verse 35, lest darkness come upon you. Now this word, darkness come upon you, literally means, lest darkness overtake you. How many of you have been out doing something, and then all of a sudden, before you knew it, you were overtaken by, by nightfall? Have you had that experience before? You didn't, didn't expect it to happen so fast. The light was just there, and all of a sudden, you turn around, and it's very, very dark. Darkness can do that. Darkness is powerful. Once the light disappears, darkness literally takes over. How many have experienced that? I experienced it real good one time. Uh, the Burns family and the Jones family were camping in Bernie Falls. And we decided to take a day trip to Mount Shasta. And we went there, and what we did was we toured the town. Now, in my estimation, you don't go to Mount Shasta to tour that little town. I mean, big deal. It was a long drive, and the whole time they were walking around getting ice cream and fudge and whatever, I was looking up at Mount Shasta, and I said, we need to hike this place, not window shop. And uh, so we got back to our camp, and I felt very discontent. And so I made up my mind I was going back the next day to hike Mount Shasta. So we did all our stuff during the day at Bernie that we were supposed to do. And in the afternoon, when it was free time, I said, I'm going back to Mount Shasta to hike. Who wants to go with me? Zero volunteers. <laughs> to my amazement, not even the First Lady, she said something like, I'm not going back to Mount Shasta. So guess what I did? I went to Sh Mount Shasta by myself to hike. Now, these educators can tell you they're aware of this fact. You are told to never go hiking by yourself. But I did, and I was having the time of my life. I went on this trail. I can't even remember to the best of my recollection looking back. I think it was called Spring Hill Trail. But it was the afternoon, and I, I went up, and I got to this vista. I was up high, and I was overseeing all of this area of Mount Shasta. And the thing that really amazed me, it was so cool, no one else in the world wanted to hike Mount Shasta that day. I was up there all alone. And I'm like, oh, Lord, thank you. I'm here all alone. This is my theater to worship you. And I'm like, no one's around. I'm going to pray and sing to you out loud. I think I even preached to the rocks because I said, can I get a hallelujah? And I heard hallelujah. The rocks were responding to me. And so I was up there singing out loud and praising, and it just felt so free. And all of a sudden, I saw that the sun was going down below the mountains. I, this, I better get out of here. And I was starting to panic. I knew I had a ways to get down. And if I didn't get down soon, I would be overtaken by this darkness. So I was kind of in a hurry, and my time of praise was quickly turning into a time of panic. And I was very quickly going down the trail, and I made a wrong turn. And I got off on this trail that was a loop. And it was getting darker and darker, and all of my manly hiking that day had made my shirt wet and sweaty, and now it was freezing. 
And I'm like, this must be why they tell you to never hike alone. I might die of hypothermia or get eaten by a beast. <laughs> and so I was panicking and all of a sudden I had to stop and collect myself. And what I did to get reoriented is I remembered what the light had shown me on that hike when I had light. And I remember back and I was able to make my way back off of that loop, back down to the main trail. But by the time I got to my car, it was completely dark. And I really, by God's grace, averted a bit of a tragedy. So I go back to the camp, pitch black, and there they all are sitting around at the campfire, roasting marshmallows. They had already had their dinner. <laughs> And I was just incredulous that not one of them had called search and rescue for me. <laughs> so I was a little angry, but also so happy to be safe and sound that I think I got all emotional. And when I got to the campfire, I pulled the tiny Tim thing. I said, God bless us all. <laughs> anyhow. Anyhow. I just want you to know, when Jesus says darkness can overtake you, I absolutely know what he's talking about to you. Yeah. Anybody want to go hiking with me? <laughs> Come along, we'll worship the Lord. Yeah. All right, so let's look at verse number 36. While you have light, do what? Believe in the light. That you may be children of light. The wonderful consolation is no matter what is going on in our lives, like these people here, what did Jesus tell them? They were conflicted about all of this that was happening, and Jesus said, all you need to do is, and this is the second commandment, is you just need to keep believing me. Don't try and figure it all out. Just believe in me, and as long as you are believing in me, you will have light, regardless of how daunting the looming darkness may seem to you, regardless of what goes on, even concerning me, that you won't see me physically anymore. Uh, as long as you keep believing in me, you are going to be all right. That's what I had to do on that trail, to revert back to what the light had showed me and go with that instinctively, even though I was like Mr. Magoo and I couldn't see clearly in the present. Okay? And so it's so simple, but it's so powerful. Command number one, walk, he said in verse number 35, in the light. And verse number 36, the second command, believe in the light, and what that is going to make you is that is going to make you children of light. So that's always our, our consolation when there are so many that reject us and our faith. My consolation every day when I get up, I know so many people want nothing to do with Christianity nowadays, but I know how they are characterized versus how I am characterized, and I do not feel badly about my position. I feel sorry for them, even though they reject our faith. They are in darkness. They are in darkness to be pitied. And yet us, what does God call us? He calls us children of light. I'll take that title any day. I want to be a card-carrying member of the Children of Light Club. And that's exactly what God has made us. And he talks about this in other places in the scripture. God tells us what a wonderful title it is. Check out Ephesians 5.8. For you were once darkness, but now you are what? Light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And what about 1 Thessalonians 5.5? Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Amen. So again, 
This whole thing that we see in John 12 as Jesus concludes his public ministry is equipping us. Equipping us to stand against the rejection that we will experience. Causing us to know that we're children of light. We're no longer in darkness. We're being equipped. And so in summary of Jesus' words here, now we're going to go on to John's commentary. Remember, Jesus gave this charge. We saw the two commandments. Anybody remember what the two commandments were? Believe and walk. Yeah, live in it. Believe it. Very good. Very wonderful. You are focused in. That's awesome. All right. So in summary, I got this summary from a study Bible, and I really like it. Jesus points to the urgent necessity of acting on the light people have. And everybody read this with me. They must give up their preconceived notions and act on Jesus' revelation. What about all my unmet expectations? Don't even think about it. Don't even go there. Just act on Jesus' revelation. Now we see John's commentary, which are verses 36b, the second half of verse 36 through 43. So let's see um, what we have here. The end of verse 36 if you have a red letter edition, it means the part that's not red. All right? I have a red letter edition right here. I love red letter editions, Mark Fetter. Do you? Yeah. Well, I guess Mark's working security. Yeah. Well, Mark loves it too. That's why I said his name. <laughs> Just believe me. You should be able to believe the pastor when he's in the pulpit. Maybe not any other time, but no, I'm kidding. <laughs> so. Uh, where the red letters stop, this is where we are right now. It says, these things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. Now, before we get any further, I just want us to realize that Jesus has been in his public ministry for three years. And most people have rejected him. And I just, I don't want to leave this portion of scripture right now without making us aware of a spiritual reality that we need to be very concerned about in our prayer life. And that is, God will only take so much rejection. There's a point where rejection crosses over the line and God will literally hide himself from the rejectors. You say, why are you bringing this up right now? Because it's Memorial Day weekend and I know a lot of people have died to give us this country and the country they died for is not the country they would see if they came back and lived. That's right. They've seen a perversion of the country that they died for. They would not recognize this America and this America is the result of massive amounts of American citizens rejecting the truth of God, right? That's right. And I wonder sometimes if we're not going to get the same treatment that Israel got, Jesus hid himself. Listen, I've been a pastor for 34 years. My suspicion, is, my suspicion is the way our country is spiritually right now, so dead, I, I really have my suspicion that the Lord has pulled back. Just like he did here. But now John gives us his commentary. And again, it complements everything we've talked about with people losing confidence in their faith because of unanswered questions, unmet expectations, and others' rejection. Look at verse 37. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they what? Believe, Believe not on him. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes, and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. So, 
That's John's commentary. And again, all of this shows that our confidence in our Christian faith should not be affected. Affected. John shows his readers that Jesus' rejection by Israel is part of what God said would happen. It was prophesied by what prophet? Isaiah. Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus came. So God said, God prophesied 700 years before this was happening in real time, that this would be the plight of Israel, that they would reject their Messiah. And therefore, it is not a reason to deny that Jesus is the Messiah. Instead, read it out loud with me, it is a sign confirming that Jesus is the Messiah. That God was talking about this happening 700 years before it happened shows that he is the one. Amen. Amen. And again, it's to the, the Jew first and also to the Gentile. And we are seeing a reversal now. We are seeing where the Gentile nations are full of rejection. And God has prophesied that we will be going through the same things. And that's why we have to understand the fact that Christianity is rejected so vehemently and contested so ferociously shows that it is true. Yeah. Because no one would spend so much time and energy and have so much rancor for something that is a myth. Yeah. Yeah. And so we have to take what John's commentary is for ourselves because we see the same thing happening in our times, what was happening in Israel. Consider 1 Timothy 4.1. Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall what? Depart, depart from the faith. But it's not just that. They're not, it's not what they're departing from. It's what they're turning to. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Remember I told you that all these brave people that, that died for our country wouldn't recognize the country they died for anymore? Why is that? Because in the rejection of the modern man in America, they have turned from the truth of God, they have turned from the light of the world, and what have they taken instead of it? Doctrines of devils. That's it. 2 Timothy 3.13, the same thing. God prophesied that we will be going through this time of rejection, just like in Jesus' time with Israel, it's with us and all the Gentile nations and the leadership, the politics of the Gentile nations. Paul prophesied, but evil men and seducers will grow worse and worse. And the problem is, not only are they deceiving others, but they themselves are being what? Deceived. Deceived because they've rejected the light of the world. Now we come down to our last verses in John chapter 12. I just love this portion of scripture. It is so fortifying. Uh, right now, all of you roll up your sleeve. Okay? Because God has given you a vitamin shot right now. Because this is equipping us. This is giving us, rather than a lack of confidence, this is giving us confidence by the precious Word of God. But look at these verses, verses 42 through 43. Nevertheless, John finishes up his commentary saying, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess in him, lest they should put, be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Where are you right now in this matter of rejection that God prophesied would be coming? 
Do you value more the praise of men? Are you reluctant to live as children of the light? Because that won't get you the praise of men? The Holy Spirit is still dealing with the idea that we need to walk in the light and believe the light regardless of anything. John MacArthur says concerning this, this is one of the saddest statements about spiritual leadership. That those in spiritual leadership would rather have the praise of men than the praise of God. Not only is it true with spiritual leadership, it is true of so many political leaders in their leadership. What they really would rather have than in their seat of office doing things that will get the praise of God. They're not interested in that at all. At all. They're interested in having the praise of men. And everything that happens becomes a fad. By the time Jesus hung on the cross, it became a fad to say, crucify him, crucify him. It became a fad for them to tell Pilate, do not release him, Re release Barabbas instead of criminal. Everybody was jumping on the bandwagon because they loved the praise of men. It was a terrible, devilish situation. And it always becomes a devilish situation when any group of people would rather have the praise of men than the praise of God, including your own individual family. As leaders in your home, parents, you've got to make sure that you train your children to not be after the praise of men. That's sycophantic. That is unhealthy. And it's not the way it's supposed to be. So as we wrap up today, as I meditated on these scriptures, and boy, I tell you, it's hard to decide how I was going to go with this. The Lord flooded my mind with so many things, and I was just getting all stirred up with passion, and I was like, I spent more time deciding what I wasn't going to say this morning than what I was going to say. But finally, when the Holy Spirit gave me that, voila, I want to talk about people hurting, people hurting in their Christian experience because of unanswered questions. And we have a lot of them, don't we? Do you have a lot of questions unanswered? I do. Or unmet expectations. We've got a lot of those, right? I go around almost every day of my life thinking, now Lord, why didn't you give me more children? I asked for five. You gave me one and she takes off to Africa. You talk about unmet expectations. And then others' rejection. Do you know how many people see me out there putting up the sign on that big ladder? Do you think we'd get 100 people coming in just out of respect for what I do? But no, it's rejection, isn't it? It's rejection. And so uh, this is the way I want to go with it because I saw indirectly that Jesus and John address all of these things. And then I was like, I just kind of want to, you know... It always happens. You get curious. I just want to look on the internet and see who talks about these things. And I came across this article by um, uh, Bob Yandian. And uh, he's from Bob Yandian Ministries. And listen to what he says here. I watched a debate one evening on television between a leading Christian minister and an atheist. The atheist was asked what event in life caused him to no longer believe in God. He said he was raised in a church and his parents were strong Christians. The dramatic change occurred when his father was dying. He prayed to God for his father to live, but he died. From that time on, he no longer believed in God. He said that most of the leading atheists came from the same kind of background. When trusting a supposed loving God ended in disappointment, they turned against God and no longer believed in His existence. They, become, they became strong voices in the scientific world for people to turn from the myth of God and follow rational empiricism. The 
Gandhian goes on to say, this sounds extreme to many Christians. They would never think of turning against God because of a disappointment. Yet, when faced with, uh, with unexplainable circumstances, when God seemed unloving and uncaring, they quit going to church. They stopped witnessing to others about Jesus and basically dis disengaged from any spiritual life at all. How many knows what he's talking about? They may not have become an atheist, but they are no longer proud to call Jesus their Savior. <coughs> they stop walking in the light. They stop believing the light. They stop uh, being children of light because of disappointment. We go back to what I said. The confidence of the Christian faith isn't designed to come by any other thing than complete trust in a person. And his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. We close today with the example of the Apostle Paul. He's a perfect example of this propositional statement I've made to you today. Do you realize that almost the entire, entirety of Paul's Christian life was that of misfortune. Just about all of it involved misfortune. When we read the life of Paul, we feel so sorry for him. What didn't happen to him that was misfortune? And it seems as we really take his life as a whole and synthesize it, we say about the only enjoyment he got to have at all in his Christian life was first of all knowing Jesus. He said that in Philippians 3.10. He said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the Amen. fellowship of his suffering, Amen. being conformable unto his death. So he did get that in enjoyment. He actually, in his suffering, experienced fellowship with Jesus. Amen? Amen? But about the only other enjoyment he got out of that Christian life, his Christian life was sweet agony, was seeing others saved. Amen. And he talked about that in 1 Thessalonians 2.19. He says... For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Amen. But Paul, again, is the perfect example of what we're talking about. Because when he talked about how he lived, he said this in Galatians 2.20. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And this is the life that he always lived in no matter what. I, this is the thing that I know when nothing else could be understood. This is what I know when there could be no other affirmation on the world. All have departed me and fled and forsaken me. But these two things who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. That's all the light we really, really ever need in life. It's faith in the Son of God, the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Will you stand now at this time? With your heads bowed and eyes closed, just want you to think about your relationship with the Lord today. Have you lost confidence in your Christian faith? I know it's easy to do. There's things that happen in our life that are so mysterious, it has us reeling. And the more we think about it, the more of a enigma it is and we we're, where is God in all this and so it is very very tough and um, Jesus understands he knows how powerful darkness is that darkness can overtake you with just a simple thought of heartbreak just a simple thought of heartbreak a simple thought of disappointment a simple thought of hurt feelings darkness can overtake you Jesus knows and so he says to you and me, let's keep this doable. 
Let's keep this sensible. Let's not get too far ahead. Let's not try and understand everything in life because that's impossible. Let's bask and relish in what we can understand, and that is the light that we have already received from Jesus, and most notably, that he loves us and he's given himself for us. That was enough light for Paul. It needs to be enough light for us. Amen. So let that always be your confidence in the Christian faith. Yeah. Let that always be your confidence in the Christian faith. And lastly today, that's Jesus' charge to you who are believers. But if you are not a believer, let me say that if you are not living today like Paul, by the faith of the Son of God, who loves you and has given himself for you, if you are not living by that, you're really not living, you're just existing. You're just existing. There's not a whole lot of difference between you and any other form of creature that's living on earth if you are not living by the faith of the Son of God, because He is the light of the world. Only He can bring you into the presence of God. Only He can give you true knowledge that you need to make your life a success in God's eyes. True knowledge. Jesus is the light of the world. Will you welcome Him into your life today? Will you get yourself out of darkness by becoming a child of light. Do that today. Accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that because you are so precious and you are so powerful, we don't feel the need to take holiday weekends off. We come in here full throttle, full intensity, because you are a great God, and every day is a day that you deserve to be proclaimed and extolled as the living and true God. So we thank you for this moment that these dear people have sanctified to you. Lord, they could have easily stayed home and sat around and relaxed, but they came seeking your face, Lord, and you did not disappoint. You've given us great content in worship of song. You've given us great content in scripture, and we feel like we are filled and right now, our souls do magnify you, Lord, and our spirits rejoice in you, God, our Savior. And all God's people said, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And amen. 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 All right. Thank you, everybody. If you need me for anything.